Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word indestructible as incapable of being destroyed, ruined, or rendered ineffective. This is the appropriate description of this episode's hero. He was given the nickname Old Indestructible for his crazy streak of games played. In 15 seasons in the NFL, he never missed a game in 170 tries. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott! This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is August 22nd, 1909, and we are in Redding, California the birthplace of our hero. Our hero this time is Melvin Jack Hine. This is the man that was known as Old Indestructible because he was a true Iron Man in the age of tough, greedy kind of play. Basically, I mean, they really didn't have any kind of protection. I mean, they had helmets and some kind of shoulder pads, but it was nowhere near what it is today. But he was still considered one of the most durable players in NFL history never missing a game in high school, college, or the NFL. So let's take it and try to figure out where, where, what kind of genes you got here. You know, not like the Levi's, but the G-E-N-E-S. His father was Herman. His mother was Charlotte. And according to the 1920 U.S. Census, the family had moved from California to Whatcom County, Washington, which borders Canada about basically as far northwest as you can get in the 48 contiguous states. So this dude was way up there in the no man's land. And in this no man's land, he attended Burlington and Fairhaven High Schools, where he favored playing football and basketball. Uh, Apparently, when he decided to go into college, he was interested in rowing. But he put aside that desire to play center, guard, and tackle at Washington State, which would end up becoming Washington State University. Overall, I'd say that was a decision that worked out, you know, favoring football and basketball over rowing. Because in college, he would be named to Grantland Rice's All-American team in 1930, after he led Washington State to a Rose Bowl bid. And then he would go into the professional ranks, but uh, before we get to that, you know, talk about his Ironman career in the NFL, I wanted to remind you to head over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes, and also, you can subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. This will make sure you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. But to kind of get into the uh, the process for him going from the college ranks to the professional ranks, there's a quote from the Pro Football Hall of Fame website to kind of describe how it went down. And here it goes. Mel had to write to three NFL teams offering his services in 1931. Providence bit first offering $135 a game. Hines signed and mailed the steamroller contract. Then he learned that he could get $150 from the Giants, so he hastily wired the Providence Postmaster, described the letter he had sent, and asked him to return it. Fortunately for the Giants, the first contract was returned, and Hine destroyed it. End quote. So because of the uh, swift acting moves of Hine and the uh, Postmaster there, the rest would become Giants history. He would go down as one of the top players in New York Giant history of all time, and this is back in the early 30s, he would be the cornerstone of the team. Now, they built their entire team around Mel Hine, and this is a center, like a center and a linebacker. So you're building your entire team around an offensive lineman. That's how good this guy was. 
Now, the center is still important today because, you know, they snap the ball and they touch the ball on every play. But back then, the uh, center position was even more demanding. You see, the 1930s, the teams in the NFL, they loved these various kinds of unbalanced lines and the center was the one in charge. Now, there's this video, I'll provide it in the link, and they have these crazy shifts with all the players just shifting around and hey, they had this one where the center was right there when they had the guy right next to him and there's only one dude on the line and all these other guys are all over the place and just different kind of crazy lineups and just kind of unique. They were getting into uh, the point of starting to work on the passing and he was one of the first centers that, you know, would get out and lead and block for the running back. But also he was one of the first centers that would take a step back and he would start to block, you know, to protect the quarterback, now known as pass blocking. I saw another article where it claimed that the Giants, you know, they had this freak athletic type of center, and, you know, he was big but fast and strong. They created a play called the center sneak, a trick play where Hine would snap the ball, and then the QB would flip it back to Hine and fake it to the halfback, and, of course, Hine would just barrel on run down towards forward the end zone, and he would work on getting towards the touchdown. So it was a uh, kind of reminded me of that play of uh, remember the little giants uh, what, what did they call that the uh, I don't know something about the hurricane rana or you know the, the Alamo or what would they call that what was that play oh wait I know what it was it was the uh, the, the annexation of Puerto Rico <laughs> we got the New York Giants in real life that gave the ball to the center and he would go towards a touchdown and he got this uh, the movie the little giants they had you know faked the ball he held it and, it was, and he just started running around so yeah we'll call that the annexation of Puerto Rico or Mel Hines' specialty, the center sneak. Now, with the Giants, he was a true 60-minute player in all sense of the phrase. Now, mind you, again, most players back then would play the entire game, you know, offense, defense, special teams, uh, get the water boy some water, Gatorade, I don't know. But he was a little bit different because as he went throughout his career, which was 15 years and 170 games, He only called for a timeout one time, and that was to make hasty repairs to a broken nose back in 1941. So we're talking a guy that would play 60 minutes the entire game for 15 full seasons of the NFL. Now that is something that just just not going to happen. It is a crazy feat to believe, especially back then, like I said, you had no protection. The helmets weren't really, the, they were like the riddle plastic helmets they were wearing in that New York Giants little league football game. And you got these shoulder pads that are pretty much just, I don't know, taped up sweater bags and stuff. And they just, it was not the same as it is today. And they were, uh, the rules were not as efficient as they are today for safety either. So just, I think that is just one of the most crucial pieces of evidence why this guy really deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, even at age 36, in his final season, he was still playing from the kickoff to the final gun. Ain't got no rest for him. He just want to go out there and play. And to kind of describe how he played for these 60 minutes, there's another little portion of an article from the Pro Football Hall of Fame websites that described his style just about as good as you could have got it. And it goes as such. Cappy could do everything expected of a center and a linebacker and quite a bit more. Mel was one of the few NFL stars who had the speed and agility to contain Green Bay's premier receiver. Don Hudson, by bottling him up on the sideline so he could not maneuver into the open. Although Mel was thoroughly aggressive and coldly ferocious when it came to blocking and tackling, he was a gentleman player. He rarely lost his temper, end quote. Now I know we don't draft offensive linemen in DraftKings, but if we did, I think this would be one of the higher salary guys. And by the way, you can get a free entry into a DraftKings tournament right now by heading over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash DraftKings again. That's the footballhistorydude.com DraftKings for a free entry into a tournament right now. But let's get back to the life and career of Mel Hine. Now, like I said, he had a 15-year professional football career as one of the best New York Giants of all time. But after that, he would become a head coach for the Union College while also playing for the Giants during for a few different seasons. He was the line coach for several pro teams, including the New York Yankees and Los Angeles Rams, and he would also be a coach over at USC for 15 years. Then in the mid-60s, Al Davis hired him to be the supervisor to the officials for the American Football League. And then after the merger between the two leagues, he was still with the AFC for a few more years after that. And he had a, a long time in football, you know, gotta figure. 
He started with the Giants in 1931, and he retired in 1974. So, we're talking a long time there. Which leaves us no doubt. There's unquestioned rivalry he should obviously be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And he was a charter member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame class in 1963. So I'm not going to go over all the different halls because, you know, he's in all the normals, the locals, the colleges and all that such. But he was also named first team all NFL center eight straight years from 1933 to 1940. He was also the second team all NFL for five other years. So the majority of his career. Now, the next one is a little bit more unique. See, Joe Carr, who passed away in 1939, was the league president. And in 1938, they decided that they were going to have the first ever award for the most valuable player in the NFL. And yes, Mel Hine received that accolade. And to this day, he's the only lineman that ever won the NFL MVP. Also, it might not be as high of an accolade, you know, in the record books, but it was certainly important because Mel Hine was the team captain for 10 of his 15 years. And even as a 60-minute man, like I said, he never missed a game in his 15-year career. And to kind of sum it up as to what he believed was a true football player of himself back in the 1930s, there's a quote from his speech from his entryment that goes as such. Now we all had to go both ways, but it was more fun that way. I would have hate to have come out of a ball game and watch him play. I didn't want to be on a bench. I wanted to be out there and see some action, end quote. And of course, his jersey, which was number seven, was retired by the New York Giants. And also Washington State University retired his number as well. But with that being said, Mel Hine was considered one of the greatest New York Giants players of all time. He was an Iron Man unlike most in any era, let alone an era where players played the full 60 minutes. In 2010, the NFL Films Group put together a top 100 list of all-time NFL greats, and Mel Hine was number 96. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude, and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about one of the most durable players in NFL history. In the upcoming episode, we're going to step away from our normal schedule of covering the Hall of Fame inaugural class to cover the life and career of Alex Spanos the longtime owner of the San Diego Chargers, who passed away last Tuesday. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going... We don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.